gifts that edify. Amen. We need the Spirit operating in our church. And God can begin to build up and do a work in each of us. Now, we're talking about the gifts of the Spirit, and there's nine of them. And we are focusing in on the uh, inspiration gifts. And some people call it the gifts of utterance. Diverse kinds of tongues, interpretation of tongues, and prophecy is what we started talking about uh, last week. And so we're going to continue on that same theme. Purpose of tongues. God didn't just come up with tongues. He has a purpose. God has a purpose to everything. He has a purpose. So here we see one of the purposes of tongues is to magnify God. What does it mean to magnify? To cause to be held in greater esteem or respect. To increase in significance. And I like this one. To enlarge. That's what it means when you magnify something. You make it bigger. And so that is really what the gifts of the Spirit do. And there are several instances in the Bible we're going to look at, but when people began to speak in tongues, it turned people's eyes towards Jesus. And they began to, it began to magnify the Lord. Amen. And I like what the psalmist said. Magnify the Lord with me. Isn't that beautiful? I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. And we're talking about tongues. Isn't that beautiful? His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. Oh, and you know, and it's hard to read that as oh. That's more like, oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. Amen. Acts 2 and 7, it says, They were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and dwellers of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, in Pontus and Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, in Egypt, in the parts of Libya, about Cyrene and strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes, Cretes and Arabians. But what were they saying? We do hear them speak in our tongue the wonderful works of God. They were talking about how wonderful God is. They were praising him. They were magnifying God. Building him up. What a sight that must have been to be praying in that upper room and then cloven tongues like as a fire appeared upon their heads and they all began to speak in other tongues. Of course, they didn't have cameras back then. This is an artist's rendition of how he think it may have looked, right? But it, all I know is I would love to have been there and seen it myself. They were all excited, and they were going, what meaneth this? That's a King James way of saying, what's going on here? What's going on? It is the power of God. That's what's going on. This is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and he is still the same. He has not changed, and he will pour out his spirit upon your flesh. If you say, Lord, here, I want you to pour your spirit out upon me. I am hungry for a move of God deep in my soul, Lord. There is a longing for me to touch you. And you begin to open your heart and reach out and believe. That's the key. You got to believe. You don't have to beg for the Holy Ghost. Please. I've heard people say that. Please give me the Holy Ghost. All you got to do is begin to say, Lord, I thank you for the greatest gift. I thank you for all the wonderful things you've done in my life. I thank you because you're a glorious, majestic, mighty, all-powerful, worthy of my praise, God. 
begin to empty out your vessel. Just begin to empty it out and say, Lord, I want to make room in my heart for more of you. Do you have room for more of him? Oh, I tell you what, that's what I say all the time. Lord, here is my cup. I want to dump all this other stuff out of here. Just get it out of here, and I want to make room for more of you in my life. And he'll do it. In Acts 10, and didn't Brother Samuels teach a good lesson on Acts 10 here a couple weeks ago? There was a certain man in Caesarea named Cornelius, a centurion of the band called the Italian band. And uh, I remember Brother Keaty was teaching all that. And he said, yeah, some guy came up to me and he said, I don't know what kind of music they were playing, but it must have been pretty good. <laughs> well, it's a band of soldiers, right? He is the centurion. He's uh, the ruler over 100 soldiers. Notice what it tells us here. He was a devout man and one that feared God with all his house, which gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always. He saw in a vision evidently about the nine hour, ninth hour of the day an angel of God coming into him and saying unto him, Cornelius. And when he looked on him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? And he said unto him, Thy prayers and thine alms are come up for a memorial before God. And now send to Joppa and call for one Simon, whose surname is Peter. Of all of the Gentiles in the world that God could have chosen, he chose Cornelius' house. He was going to be the house where the Holy Spirit was going to be poured out upon the Gentiles. What an honor. Amen? And so it says... And the morrow, after they entered into Caesarea, Cornelius waited for them. And when he had called together his kinsmen and near friends. Think about that. So he's gathering up all of his relatives and his friends and bringing them to the house because they're going to come and they're going to hear what Peter has to tell them. I'm sure he was telling them, hey, an angel came. And an angel told me to send for this man named Peter. And when he gets here, he's going to show us what God has for us. And so everybody was all excited, so they were coming to the house. And as Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter took him up, saying, Stand up, I myself also am a man. How about all the people that prayed to that statue at the basilica? And they kissed the toe. There's what Peter said right there. Stand up, don't pray to me. I'm just a man. It's all about him. That's who you need to be praying to. It's God. And as he talked with him, he went in and found that many. So he gets invited over to preach. And when he gets to the house, it says, many were come together. I wonder how exciting it must have been when he walked in there and he saw all of his friends and his family all coming to hear the message that he was going to bring them about God. And this is what he's preached. God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. For God was with him. And we are witnesses of all the things which he did, both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they slew and hanged on a tree. Him God raised up the third day and showed him openly. Hey, Easter's this weekend, huh? Amen. Not to all people, but unto witnesses chosen before of God, even to us who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that it is he which was ordained of God to be the judge of quick and dead. To him give all the prophets witness that through his name, what's that name? It's through his name. The name of Jesus, whosoever believes in him shall receive remission of sins. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell. Woo! The Holy Ghost was poured out. The Holy Ghost was shed abroad on all of their hearts. It was like God opened up the windows of heaven and he began to pour out Holy Ghost upon all of the people that were in the house. On all them which heard the word, the Holy Ghost fell. 
And Peter said, we're going to have to baptize these folks because they got the Holy Ghost. How did they know they had the Holy Ghost? It says, for they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. So they were exalting God. That's what they were saying. It doesn't tell us everything they were saying, but we know they were magnifying God. Beautiful. So that's one of the purposes of tongues is to magnify God. Amen. Personal edification. 1 Corinthians 14 and 4, it says, He that speaks in an unknown tongue edifies himself, but he that prophesies edifies the church. So there you see, you build yourself up. Isn't that what we said edify means? It means build up. So you match that scripture up to Jude 1 and 20. It says, but ye be loved, building up yourselves. How are you going to build up yourself? On your most holy faith, and then he tells you right there how to do it. Praying in the Holy Ghost. Isn't that awesome? So you're building yourself up. You're edifying yourself. Hey, I need to put another brick on there. I'm building a beautiful building for God. A temple that God can dwell in. You are the temple of the Holy Ghost. And God is working on you right now. Anybody perfect yet? He's still working on me. He's patient and loving. Amen. It only took him a week to make the moon and the stars, the earth and the moon, Jupiter and Mars. How loving and patient he must be because he's still working on me. And he's got to be patient with me. Keep yourselves in the love of God. Love that. How are you going to do it? You're going to be praying in the Holy Ghost. You're going to be looking for his return. I want to pull a couple of words out of that. We're going to look at building up and keep. And right there, building up, 2026, and keep, 5083, out of those two verses. To build up, it literally means to build a house. Well build it, especially, and then he says right there, especially of edifying. And there it shows you example. There it is in 1 Corinthians 14 and 4. But it's talking about how it's, that's where that word is used. But it's the thought is you're a builder and you're building. Think about this, the wise man that builds his house upon a rock, right? You're building a house. You're building, Paul said, we're building together a habitation, right? Our lives are being built together as a habitation for God. And God is wanting to, to have a place for his spirit to dwell and his temple is holy. Amen? It's got to be a holy temple. And it's got to be a temple where, where God can feel comfortable and where God is right at home. And so what we say is, Lord, I want my heart to be your dwelling place. Can you say that tonight? Lord, I want my heart, my life, I want to be in your presence, Lord. I want your spirit to dwell inside of me. Help me to build a vessel of honor. The treasure of God is being stored in this vessel. But it's a vessel that's made out of clay. Amen. But I want it to be a vessel, Lord, that you can dwell in. A vessel of honor. Meet for the master's use. That's what they said. Go pray for Paul. He is a chosen vessel. I've chosen him. My spirit is going to dwell in him and reside there. I will walk in them. I will dwell in them. They will be my people, and I will be their God. I will write my laws within their heart. That's what I want God to do right now in my life. I want him to write his laws in my heart. I want his spirit to begin to change me from the inside. Jesus on the inside. Christ in you, the hope of glory. How could anyone not want the baptism of the Holy Ghost? You should say, Lord, give me 
more. <laughs> Give me more, Lord. I want more of you. Keep. Watch over. Preserve. Keep. Watch. In fact, it says that the, in Matthew 28, where it's talking about the keepers. You know, they were told to keep. So they were like guards. And they were watching over the tomb, right? Think about that. We have to keep ourselves in the love of God. We have to keep the faith. We have to keep his commandments. These are things that we do in our lives. How are you going to be able to do it? With the power of the Holy Ghost. You're not going to make it in your flesh. In your flesh, there is no good thing. Your flesh can't do it. There's a lot of people who talk about how, oh, I want to be a good person. Amen. And you could try. There's a lot. I've, I've met a lot of good people. They're just good Christian people. But you know what? They still got a temper. <laughs> Amen. They still got a temper. I'll meet you in the parking lot. You know, it's you got to have the Holy Ghost. Man, you got to be spiritual. You can't be carnal. And you just say, Lord, I need the Holy Ghost. I want to be kept by the power of God. And I can't do it in myself. I need Holy Ghost power. Guard and keep yourselves. This is in the Amplified. He says, but ye beloved, build yourselves up, founded on your most holy faith. I like this. Make progress. Rise like an edifice higher and higher. Think about a skyscraper. They're just putting layer upon layer upon layer upon layer, and it's rising up, building up. You have to build a skyscraper from the bottom up. You can't start on the top floor, right? You start down here with the foundation, and then you begin to build it up. Oh, you know what? Building us together. That's what the Lord wants to do. Rise like an edifice higher and higher. And then you tell you're going to do it. Praying in the Holy Spirit. That's what he said. Guard and keep yourselves in the love of God. Expect and patiently wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah, which will bring you unto life eternal. He is going to bring us there. He is going to take us home. He has gone to prepare a place for us. He said, I will come again. Hang on to those words right there. I will come again. That where I am, there ye may be also. Amen. And I'm looking forward to that. Lord, how can we know the way? I am the way. Hallelujah. Seven commands to Christians there in Jude 1 and 20. This is from the Dakes. Build up yourselves on your most holy faith. Pray in the Holy Ghost. Even Dakes stuck it in there. Pray in the Holy Ghost. Keep yourselves in the love of God. Look for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ. Have compassion on some making a distinction between those who are weak and ignorant and those who are proud and arrogant and unwilling to obey the truth, save the willing with fear, pulling them out of the fate of eternal hell and hate even the garment spotted by the flesh. That's what it says there at the end of Jude. So he's saying, of some have compassion, making a difference. That should be something you want to do is make a difference. Are you making a difference in anyone's life? With your prayers, with your example of your life, are you a bright and shining light that's leading people towards Jesus? Amen. You can't do it by yourself. You need the Holy Ghost. Amen. You got to have the Holy Ghost guiding you. This is from Brother Bernard's book, Spiritual Gifts. Generally, if a spirit-filled person is encouraged to pursue tongues for private devotion and to believe for this ongoing experience, he will speak in tongues again. Now, he's talking about the initial baptism of the Holy Ghost, and there's some people, they go, "Woo! I got the Holy Ghost. Thank goodness I don't have to try to do that ever again. How sad is that? 
Or if somebody says, Woo, I've been born again. Woo, now I've arrived. Imagine a baby saying that. It's a new birth. You're starting at the very beginning. You're born. Now you have your whole life ahead of you to grow and to learn and to develop and to build up. Edify. You, you can't just sit where you're at. Imagine a little baby. And believe me, there's some people who have arrested emotional development. Ever been around anybody like that? I beat them sometimes. You have to talk to them like you're talking to a fourth grader. Okay, let me explain it to you again. This is what you need to do. It's not a plea of guilt. The number on the right is where you call the court. That's the address for the court right there. But I don't think I'm okay. I'm trying to explain to you what you need to do. Sometimes we have to keep growing past the fourth grade. But think about that in the spiritual realm. There's some people who have been in church their whole lives and they're spiritual babies. At the time when they should have meat and their their senses. They should be able to discern they're still drinking milk. Woo! That was just free. I just put that in there for free for y'all. But the Holy Ghost helps us to grow, to take it to the next level. We don't want to be fleshly and carnal, but we want to be spiritual. And how do we do it? We build ourselves up praying in the Holy Ghost and that's what he's saying here if a person is encouraged to pursue speaking in tongues for private devotion that's what we're doing right now that's what this teaching is about right here I'm talking about purpose of the Holy Ghost one of the purposes of the Holy Ghost is so you can have personal edification right he that prays in an unknown tongue edifies himself He builds himself up praying in an unknown tongue. So when you speak in tongues, he says here, I spake, I received the Holy Spirit at the age of seven, but I did not speak in tongues again until I was a young adult. As a college student, I examined my own, my personal beliefs and experience with God, and I began to seek God's will in this matter. I prayed often that God would grant me the liberty to speak in tongues and private devotion For I concluded that it was his will for all believers to have this blessing. That's what he said. I believe that everyone should have this blessing. Gradually, I began to break down reservations and doubt to develop greater desire and faith and to yield. That's key right there, to yield. You know what you say when you yield? I surrender. I surrender, Lord, I lay myself on the altar, and I acknowledge, God, I need you. Oh, how important is it to get to that place? Lord, I need you. I don't have all the answers, God. I can't do it myself. I pray, God, that the Spirit will begin to pray through me. Lord, I pray with groanings which cannot be uttered, groanings that I don't even understand, God. I pray that the Spirit will begin to pray through me and to help me. Yes. That's in Romans 8. The Spirit actually prays through us and helps us. We can't know the will of God. What we ought to pray for as we ought to, sometimes God's Spirit helps helps us that's what he's saying here he had to yield now this is from uh, brother stone king's book the term that is most familiar to us is the gift of tongues he says but here again we are involved with a spiritual term rather than a biblical term the bible does not say gift of tongues but states divers kinds of tongues If a person speaks at various times throughout the Christian experience with joy and blessing, as he or she is moved upon by the Holy Ghost, it merely means that the Holy Ghost is alive within them. Woo! Amen? God's not dead. He's alive. I feel him in my hands. 
I feel him in my feet. Amen. I feel him in my soul. I feel him all over me. God's not dead. He's alive. Right? Let the Holy Ghost begin to move within you. Leading obstetricians have stated that with every normal life that is born into this world, sound accompanies that life. Isn't that beautiful? Sound is so significant of life. As long as a person lives, we can expect sound to issue forth from that life. So it is when we are born of the Spirit of God. Once we have received the Holy Ghost, we can fully expect that the living Spirit to speak through us from time to time as we are alive spiritually. To speak with tongues from time to time with joy and blessing simply means the Spirit of God is alive within us. This is normal. When you have been born of the Spirit, it is normal for the Spirit to want to make sounds. That's what he's saying. Wouldn't you be nervous if a baby was born and the baby didn't make any sound? Right? Speaking in tongues for personal edification. This is Brother Stone King here still. Speaking in tongues for personal edification as the gift of the Spirit with the diverse kinds of tongues which enables one to speak with tongues at will almost instantaneously. Let us clarify this statement. People who have diverse kinds of tongues for personal edification, here you go, he's going to tell you how to do it, can close their eyes and begin speaking with tongues as they turn their attention upon him. So you begin to pray, you just block out the world, focus your eyes, turn your eyes upon Jesus and allow him to begin to speak through you and you're speaking to him. It is just there. As if the Spirit just hovers in their throat and mind, some people with this gift can speak with tongues in their minds. They can actually hear it as it were the words being spoken there. This gift is of great spiritual blessing to the individual. Woo! You just feel it flowing through you. It's going to take your walk with God to another dimension and take you closer to him as you allow God to yield, as you yield to God and you allow him to begin to flow through you. The in, it allows the individual a marvelous outlet in his or her personal prayer and devotional life to God. I really, really like Brother Stone King's book on the gifts of the Spirit. He describes it so simply you know some books you read it's like complicated and you're trying to figure it out he just explains it so simply and it's so beautiful here's the scripture in Romans 8 and 26 likewise the spirit also helps our infirmities for we know not what we should pray for as we ought but the Spirit itself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. So the Spirit is actually interceding on our behalf as it's flowing through us. Anybody ready to say, Lord, flow through me. Flow through my lips, Lord. Just use my lips. Use my body. Begin to speak through me. I yield. And then he talks about dealing with a heavy burden. How many times have we gone before God with a heavy burden and our human understanding and mentality have failed to adequately express in our knowledge of vocabulary the burden which we are involved? We cannot put it into words. Many times Holy Ghost filled children of God have said, See if you've ever said this, God, I cannot find the words. My burden is too heavy. That's when the Spirit itself helps us. Sometimes we just don't know what to pray for. We don't know what to pray for. But God can pray through us. Immediately an unction comes from God and we find ourselves praying with tongues for sometimes 
many minutes, even hours. But when the spirit of prayer lifts, the burden is also taken care of, and we feel, in a sense, that we have, quote, prayed through. Anybody ever tell you that? You need to pray through. What does that mean? That means you pray through until you touch God and you'll feel the burden lift. Amen. That's what he's talking about. Beautiful. Beautiful. Purposes of tongues. Personal edification is a purpose of tongues. So look at there what we've talked about. The evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Speaking supernaturally to God. Magnifying God. Personal edification. And sometimes tongues are used as a sign to unbelievers. 1 Corinthians 14 and 21, it says, In the law it is written, With men of other tongues and other lips will I speak unto this people. And yet for all that will they not hear me, says the Lord. Wherefore, tongues are for a sign, not to them that believe, but to them that believe not right of course what scripture is he talking about there anybody familiar with that it's actually in Isaiah Isaiah 28 it says in verse 11 for with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people and some people have tried to say oh well that's when they were captured and they were carried away into captivity yeah but what about the rest of it there it says to whom he said this is the rest (laughs) I don't think it was very restful (laughs) to be carried away into captivity. This is the refreshing. This is the rest. How would you describe the Holy Ghost? Refreshing. Amen. When that wind just begins to blow through there, I guarantee you, you just feel refreshed in your soul. When God begins to uh, move on you with his spirit, This is from the Dakes. It says, With men of other tongues and other lips will I speak unto this people, yet for all that will they not hear me, says the Lord. This prophecy reveals that God intended over 700 years before Christ to speak to people with stammering lips and other languages. And that is how Paul interpreted it. In 1 Corinthians 14, he tells you that's why that prophecy was put there. It's talking about stammering lips and other tongues. Modern day examples. An unbelieving Japanese man, this is from uh, Brother Stone King, hearing an American Pentecostal witness the glory of the Pentecostal experience was unmoved by the testimony received. Until suddenly, the American became moved on by the Holy Ghost and began speaking with tongues. The shock and amazement of the Japanese man was readily seen. Why? Because the American who knew not the Japanese language was speaking Japanese. As the Spirit of God came him, gave him utterance, telling the Japanese man of the truth and glory of God. Woo! The Japanese man was immediately converted and he himself received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Speaking with tongues. What a testimony. The author himself personally knows personally a young man who received the Holy Ghost at the age of 10 in a camp meeting. The 10-year-old seeking the baptism of the Holy Ghost suddenly received it. Visiting missionaries at the campground from South America were summoned to come close to the child as he received the Spirit of God. Immediately upon drawing near to the child, the missionary exclaimed, We understand the child. He's speaking Portuguese. He's a little child said the child knew nothing of Portuguese, but he was speaking with tongues as the Spirit of God gave him utterance. What was the child saying? I am sure you want to know. Among general praise and worship to God's statement was repeatedly, was said repeatedly, I am being filled with a river of life. Woo! Out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they had not yet received, because it was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. Amen. But I'm happy to say that 
on the day of Pentecost. God poured out his spirit, and Peter said, The promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off, even a 10-year-old at a camp meeting. Amen. It still happens today. People receiving the baptism of the Holy Ghost, speaking in earthly languages unknown to them. Some missionaries have reported natives receiving the baptism, speaking in clear, fluent English, having never heard or learned English. How great and thrilling are the ways of God. If only people would believe, people may also receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost, speaking with heavenly tongues, which are unknown to anyone on earth. The important thing is that the believer speaks with tongues as the Spirit of God gives him the utterance. It cannot be taught. It cannot be learned. God gives the utterance. Amen? Messages to the church through interpretation. On the day of Pentecost, 120 believers spoke in tongues at the same time when they received the Holy Spirit. Likewise, in Acts 10, the entire household of Cornelius spoke in tongues together, and in Acts 19, 12 disciples at Ephesus spoke in tongues. Yet, 1 Corinthians 14, 27 says that in public worship service, believers should take turns speaking in tongues to the congregation, and only two or three people should give such messages. Can you see the distinction? We talked about that. The, the initial outpouring of the Holy Ghost is for everyone. If God came and poured his spirit out in this building and every person immediately started speaking in tongues and was filled with the Holy Ghost, that's tongues, but it's not being used as the same way as tongues and interpretation. So he's showing you that's the distinction. In the accounts and acts, no one interpreted the tongues or even tried to do so. Now, they heard them speaking in their language. But it's not like a message came. People pause. They're waiting for the interpretation. And then the interpretation comes as to what was just said. That's what he's talking about in 1 Corinthians when he says that they should take turns. If someone speaks in tongues in a service, he should pray for the interpretation. Tongues and interpretation, and if there be... And if there is none, he should be quiet. And that's 1 Corinthians 14 and 13, and then again in verse 28. So here it is. Straight out of your King James. How is it then, brethren, when you come together? Every one of you has a psalm, has a doctrine, has a tongue, has a revelation, has an interpretation. And I love this. Let most things be done unto edifying. All things, right? So that's the purpose. You have to understand what it's all about. When God gives the gifts, they're the gifts that edify. That's the title of the chapter that we're in right now, Gifts That Edify. God wants to see the church built up, and that's why he pours out the Spirit. If any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two, or at most by three, and that by course. And that one interpret. Now, picture somebody walks in that back door. The preacher's up here preaching. And while the preacher's preaching, all of a sudden somebody jumps up and starts speaking in tongues. They jump up over here and start speaking in tongues. They jump over here and start speaking in tongues all at the same time. And the preacher's trying to preach over them. Does that sound kind of confusing? That would be confusing, right? Is God the author of confusion? The gifts are for edifying. But if there be no interpreter, let him keep silence in the church and let him speak to himself and to God. Now, you're at home praying and you're going to edify yourself by praying in tongues loudly. Is that all right? Yes, absolutely. As much as you want. In fact, Paul said, I thank God that I speak in tongues more than ye all. Amen? So it's, it's a good thing to speak in tongues. The author talked with many who are gifted in speaking with tongues for church edification. So he's clarifying. Tongues for church edification. 
Remember we talked about tongues for personal edification. He that speaks in an unknown tongue edifies himself. Now he's talking about tongues for church edification. Most people who are possessors of this gift of the Spirit know as they approach the house of God or at the beginning of a service if God wishes to use them in that particular service. The unction may be felt prior to or during the course of the service and built up until God's proper time. It will come forth with power and anointing. If the message giver is inexperienced in the gifts of the Spirit, he may give forth the utterance from God before the proper time. If this happens, the message will be less effective than if the unction had been held by the individual until God, by the moving of his Spirit, made place for it. And I've been in many services where God is moving and people are all excited and they're jumping and they're shouting and then all of a sudden you can just feel a shift in the Spirit. And it almost becomes like a, a stillness. And you're just way you're thinking, God's fixing to want to do something here. And, and sometimes the pastor will say, all right, everybody, be still. Be still. God's leading us beside the still waters. God wants to do something. And then we began to open our hearts. And we start to say things like, speak, Lord. And then all of a sudden, someone, now here's the key. You have to yield. God's not going to grab your mouth and go. Right? Someone that God is speaking to and dealing with them, the Spirit begins to flow through them. And notice what he says here. If the person is inexperienced, like Samuel, when he ran in there and he said, Eli, you called me? He was but a youth. He didn't know the voice of God yet. Sometimes when someone is inexperienced, they're learning. God understands. God wants to use them, but they just have to yield and allow him to use them. It is possible for one to speak out in tongues during a service, thinking it is a message in tongues for interpretation, when it is in reality an utterance from the heart, speaking out burden, praise, or blessing. A man of God in the pulpit understanding the gifts of the Spirit, having possession of them himself, will be able to regulate people like this, knowing the difference between the person speaking out and the heaven-sent unction. Discernment, right? God will help give you discernment, and you can feel after the Spirit, and God's going to lead the service. As with tongues, this is uh, Brother Bernard. As with tongues, I have observed many examples of interpretation of tongues around the world. It is particularly interesting to see tongues and interpretation at work in a language other than one's own. In Korea, I heard public tongues followed by interpretations in Korean, which I understood. In Italy, I heard a public tongue followed by an interpretation in Italian, which I did not understand. A man who knew both Italian and English translated the interpretation for me. Isn't that amazing? God knows every language. Amen? God can speak any language. God is everywhere. The heaven is my throne. Right? The earth is my footstool. His glory fills the heaven and the earth, and there's no limiting of his understanding. He has all power and all knowledge. He is worthy. He knows the end from the beginning. He knows what you need of before you even start praying. And so he will actually help you to pray the right prayers. How? Praying in the Holy Spirit. Building up your faith, looking to God and saying, Lord, I just want to get my flesh out of the way. Lord, I want to perfect holiness in the fear of God. I want to become more like Jesus every day. But you know what? You're never going to do it in your flesh. In my flesh, there is no good thing. Oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God 
through Jesus Christ, our Lord. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. If you began to feel after the Spirit, if you began to seek after the Spirit, if you began to say, Lord, I want to be more spiritual and I want to be less carnal. God, I pray that you will begin to change me from the inside. I want to yield to your Spirit. I want your Spirit to lead me, to guide me every day. For to be spiritually minded is life and peace. To be carnally minded is death. Oh, but I want to put away my flesh. And I want to allow the Spirit to guide my steps every day. I want to become more like Jesus every day. How is it going to happen? I'm going to begin to pray in the Spirit and say, God, I covet earnestly the best gifts. Woo! Woo! Come on, it's time right now. It's time. You need to open up your heart and say, God, oh, I want to be a vessel of honor. I want to be a vessel in which your spirit can move. A vessel, Lord, in which your spirit can reside. I want you to help me to put away my flesh. Woo. Come on, talk to the Lord right now. There Hallelujah. Oh, you can't do it by yourself. Oh, but you can do it with the power of God. You can do it with the power of His Spirit. Oh, you may feel like you're shackled and bound by your flesh. Oh, but I'm here to tell you that He can break every chain. He can set the captive free. He came to bring deliverance into your life. You can be that person you want to be. To break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. There is power Come on. in the name of Jesus. Come on, you declare it. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power. There is power. know where it is to break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. Come on, say to break every chain, break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. There's an army rising up. There's an army. 